Hello, listeners. Welcome to Cobb's Corner. I'm your host, Morgan Cobbs. Today we're going to be <coughs> reviewing... Today we're going to be reviewing Captain America, The First Avenger. This is a film from 2011. It introduced us to uh, Chris Evans as Steve Rogers, Captain America. Also to Sebastian Stan as Bucky Barnes. And really kind of, it's, it's so, sort of an MCU prequel. You know, it's a prequel to the prior uh, films. This film goes back to World War II, uh, hence the title, The First Avenger. So we're going to be talking about that today. Stay tuned. The film starts in the 21st century. It starts in about 2010, 11-ish. The opening scene takes place during Nick Fury's big week, which I think I mentioned in a previous episode about how some of the events of The Incredible Hulk, Iron Man 2, and Thor occur during the same week. The opening scene of this movie occurs, I think, at the start of Nick Fury's big week, where they find... Captain America's body uh, frozen in the Arctic, frozen in the in the Arctic Circle, and he's been frozen for almost seventy years. They realize that it's Captain America, and then they find him. That's at the very start of the film. Then we go back to nineteen forty-two. Yeah, go back back to World War Two, to Tonsberg, Norway. Which, if you remember from my last episode. Is the exact same place where Odin fought the Frost Giants back in in the movie Thor. Back well, back in 965 AD, if my memory serves me correct. And apparently, at that point, he gave one of his treasures, the Tesseract, to to mankind to for them to house in Tonsberg, Norway, and. And they've kept it hidden, and the Tesseract kind of fell into uh, mortal myth and legend. But then Johann Schmidt, who was a Nazi scientist during World War II, he is the leader of Hydra, which is a Nazi uh, deep science uh, research department. And he seeks to find the Tesseract and have unlimited power, unlimited energy, and and then so he finds the Tesseract in Tonsberg, Norway, and escapes with it. We then cut to New York. We see Steve Rogers, who's he's short, he's a little scrawny, and he has five times attempted to join the army and he's been rejected five different times he's lied on his forms he's claimed to be from like five different cities like New Haven Paramus from you know Brooklyn which is actually where he's from and you know it's five separate tries in five separate cities and they all have said no and and then, um, but then his friend, Bucky Barnes, who actually, uh, played by Sebastian Stan, his friend, uh, James Buchanan Barnes, or Bucky, uh, saves him from a brawl, from, get, from getting jumped in an alley. And at that, during that sequence, Steve gives his, his iconic line, I can do this all day. And... Bucky steps in, ends the fight, and then the two of them head over to, well, Bucky says they're going to the future, they're headed to the Stark Expo, which, if you remember from Iron Man 2, is the exact same, like, Stark Expo that Tony had in about, chronologically, 2010, so this is probably one of the earliest, one of the earlier Stark Expos. Stark Expo 1943, and we actually see Howard Stark, a young Howard Stark, 
in this film. Howard Stark, he's maybe uh, mid to late 20s, maybe even early 30s at this point. <clears throat> and he does, a he does a weapons demonstration and of a, of, of a car that can kind of levitate, magnetic levitation, and of course it, you know, fails <laughs> at the first demonstration. Um, you know, but, but yeah, you know, that they have Howard Stark at this expo, they have the Marvel Comics deep cut, the suit for the original Human Torch, back when Marvel Comics was Timely Comics, it's back in like the 1940s, the original Human Torch, which was not Johnny Storm, they have his original suit, and the name of the doctor who's, who, who was the Human Torch initially, who teamed up with uh, Namor the Submariner and like you know, one of the first groups of superheroes back in the 19, either 30s or 40s, back when Marvel Comics was Timely Comics. And Chris Evans, the same guy who was playing Captain America, he played the Human Torch back in the 2000s in the Fantastic Four films. So I thought that was a nice little uh, nod to the comics. And then... And then um, Dr. Erskine. Dr. Erskine, who was a German doctor who defected to the United States. German doctor who defected to the United States who had developed a super soldier serum that Johann Schmidt, who we later find out is the Red Skull, that he had taken this serum. And, you know, the serum only amplifies what's inside, you know, good becomes great, bad becomes worse, so he's doing research with what's as of now known as the Strategic Scientific Reserve, the SSR, which is the precursor to the organization that we all know as SHIELD, the Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division, or SHIELD, so the SSR is the precursor to SHIELD, and he is working with the SSR and the U.S. Army, they are looking for the looking for someone to be the first of many. The plan was to be the first of many super soldiers, and so Erskine he approaches Steve just with an opportunity. He says, "I want to give you a chance you know, to join the army and to you know kind of test your might." Not just physically, but also emotionally. See what kind of person you are, and that sort of thing. And through a few tests, like one of them was you know, he. So Steve is sent to Camp Lehigh in New Jersey, which that look that location does come up again in future films. And so, so there's a test where uh, Tommy Lee Jones' character, Tommy Lee Jones, he plays the sergeant. He has a, it's a fake grenade, but he kind of activates it and throws it just as, as everyone's like doing jumping jacks. It's like he says, grenade, and then everybody else runs away, but then Steve gets on top of the grenade and tells everybody, get back, get back, you know. So it was at that moment that they knew that he, would, that he was worthy of the super soldier serum. Because again, the serum does not change anything about the person. It only amplifies what's already inside and it's the same super soldier program that Thaddeus Ross in the first in, in the Incredible Hulk attempted to replicate. There were multiple attempts to replicate the super soldier serum. And uh, so Steve is given the serum. He's put in this like test contraption thing where he's given dosages of the serum and uh, Vita rays as well. And so, and this is all done in like a secret, like a secret facility in, like secret underground facility in Brooklyn. And so he is then, after being given the serum, he, you know, feels taller and stronger. And um, actress Haley Atwell, who plays Agent Carter, Agent Peggy Carter, <laughs> This is an improvised moment. She actually like <laughs> lightly touches um, 
Steve's, I think, left pectoral muscle. Uh, because she had never seen um, Chris Evans. She had never seen Chris Evans shirtless, so she kind of breaks character in that moment. And and uh, so then there's a secret Hydra agent who has infiltrated the State Department. And, you know, he blows up that... There's an explosion at that facility. He kills Erskine, and then Steve... Um, tracks down, tracks down the uh, the Hydra, the Hydra spy, the Hydra agent. Tracks him down, confronts him, and but then he ingests, then the Hydra agent ingests cyanide, and we don't find out anything else. And all the dosages of the super soldier serum are gone. They're encoded in Steve's blood, so he donates his blood to try and replicate. The serum, although they don't end up, they don't actually end up replicating it. And then after that, you know, public, public, uh, you know, chase that he had, you know, the country has seen it. And Senator Brandt, Brandt, who's a senator for the state of New York, he ends up making Steve Rogers this, like, kind of showman. Like, he doesn't go to the front lines of the war. He goes to these USO shows where he tries to get people to buy Series E bonds and, like, bonds by bullets and, you know, bullets by, you know, guns. And so he becomes kind of the figurehead for, you know, America, for the U.S. Army, and, you know, um, Captain America, almost like Uncle Sam, sort of, you know, he becomes kind of the new Uncle Sam, it's like, I want you to buy bail, I want you to buy Series E bonds, so we can, to help our, to help our boys that we got fighting in Japan and in Germany, and, you know, defeat the Nazis, and, and then there's, he even, like, has these, like, staged, He's like during the performances where he, you know, knocks out Adolf Hitler, and and then that's the same pose pose from the Captain America original Captain America comic, which we actually see in the movie. The Captain America comic book, the issue number one from the 1940s of Captain America knocking out Adolf Hitler, and this comic came out. This issue was from 1941, and this picture of Captain America knocking out Hitler was used as a political statement by Stan Lee to encourage America to join the war effort and to join the fight against Nazis and, and the Nazi regime. And it was a, and he also kind of did that. To kind of, I guess, clap back at Nazi sympathizers in the United States and people who were against intervention. This was Stan Lee's statement of saying we need to enter the war, win the war, end the Nazi regime. And you know, Stan Lee had always said that Marvel Comics will always be a reflection of the world that we live in. And I think Marvel Comics and the MCU at large that we have now are definitely reflections of his vision. Just a little tan tangent I went on. But, you know, then eventually Steve has to perform in front of, in, I guess, Italy. Italy, 1944. Italy, 1944, in front of some actual, um, actual uh, soldiers, what's left of the 107th, the 107th uh, Infantry, which is the same battalion that his best friend Bucky is a part of. He finds out that Bucky has been captured and most of the 107th has been captured behind enemy lines. He is instructed by the sergeant not, or the general not to intervene, not to 
plan a rescue mission or anything. So, but then he pretty much goes eight, goes AWOL, and he, along with Agent Carter and um, Howard Stark, who we find out is a civilian pilot, they fly into Austria, and they actually come under fire, and Steve jumps out of the plane with a parachute, and he leads the rescue mission. He rescues what's left of the 107th. He finds Bucky. They blow up that entire facility. Well, Reds, well, Johann Schmidt takes off his, I guess, skin, his fake skin that he was using to cover up. He was using to cover up his Red Skull. He officially, we officially see him as the Red Skull. He escapes and, ex and blows up the whole factory. And the 107th, they march back to their base. And Steve, upon arrival, he says, I surrender myself for disciplinary action. But then the general says, that won't be necessary. Bucky, and then Bucky says, let's hear it for Captain America. And at that moment, Steve had officially become Captain America. Same Captain America from all the kind of you know, publicity shows and the newsreels, the staged and scripted, you know, newsreels and all that. You know, now he's really a war hero. And they go through and they liberate. They blow up, you know, Hydra factory after factory after factory. And then they come to realize, oh, and, well... Steve finally gets his actual uh, shield, his actual shield um, for Captain America, which has kind of gone through upgrades throughout the movie, from first <laughs> a trash can to cab door to then prototype for to well an actual metal shield, red, white, and blue metal shield that was not in a circ that was not circular, to then the prototype for what would be his final shield to then the actual shield. And the prototype for his shield is made out of vibranium. And this is the first time that we hear about vibranium in the MCU. Vibranium is the rarest metal on Earth. It's the strongest metal on Earth, and it is the rarest metal on Earth. Now, uh, in the Marvel comics, it is said that Howard Stark and his researchers found vibranium in the deepest Africa. So they could have been referring to, it's doubtful that they were referring to the, con the nation of Wakanda, which is a nation that we haven't been to yet. Um, they show up in a future film. I don't want to reveal too much, but Wakanda, they have most of the world's vibranium. They could have found it on like small traces in islands in the Indian Ocean or Atlantic Ocean. So it's not specified in the comics specifically where they find the vibranium, but it's only a small amount. And then the, the scientists, like uh, Professor Brown, I think was his name in the comics. I forget what his actual name was. He mixed vibranium with iron and then like another mystery element and then he like fell asleep and then woke up the next day and then Captain America's shield was rent was prototype for Captain America's shield was rendered but in the comics they refer to it as proto adamantium adamantium which X-Men fans will will know is the same metal that's on Wolverine's claw so in the Marvel comics Captain America's shield is not pure vibranium it is vibranium mixed with metal it is proto adamantium it is like the prototype for what would eventually become ad adamantium. And then William Strucker, 30 years later in the 1970s, replicated that same process with vibranium, iron, and the unknown element and made adamantium and put it, and put it onto Wolverine's uh, skeleton. But as far as the MCU is concerned... Captain America's shield is vibranium. You know, it's pure, pure, pure vibranium. Um, they don't mention iron or any other elements, so 
for the purposes of the MCU, Captain America's shield is vibranium. So after getting his shield and his red, white, and blue, um, you know, uh, suit, you know, his classic uh, Captain America outfit, they then go factory to factory and, you know, blow up a ton of factories and bases run by Hydra and... There's a scene on a train where they stop and apprehend. They end up apprehending the train, but is at great cost. Um, Steve loses his best friend, Bucky. Best friend, Bucky, who was experimented on by Hydra. He, he, he dies, unfortunately. And at his sacrifice, they, by his sacrifice, they are able to stop the train and they apprehend uh, the scientist Artem Zola who is working with Johann Schmidt they apprehend him and he's detained and then they realize that and then he is granted he is I guess granted safe passage back to Switzerland in exchange for his full cooperation and he informs the general that that yo that Red Skull plans to bomb every major city in the world, and then Captain America and his Howling Commandos, you know, Captain America and his his uh, Howling Commandos, which are kind of his group, the group of soldiers that travel around with him, they go over to. The last Hydra base, which is, you know, buried 500 feet below the ground in the German Alps, and they find this giant, this giant um, plane called the Valkyrie that Red Skull plans to bomb the world with, essentially. And Captain America, he is brought onto this plane. And he, well, upon upon their arrival at the at the um, base, he makes his way onto the Valkyrie. Uh, first, receiving a kiss from Peggy Carter, who's been kind of the love interest throughout this film. And it's funny because, like, Tommy Lee Jones, he kind of it's like his his character kind of says, "I'm not kissing you." <laughs> And then they, then he goes onto, um, onto the plane. In the car that they're driving, which is a you know, Hydra vehicle, there's a button with a K on it, and the German around that button translates to "Do not touch." This is a callback to Tommy Lee Jones' character, Agent K, from Men in Black. He he had a car with a butt with a red button <laughs> that was like a "Do not touch" button, and so so kind of that button being like the Nitro's booster, and um, so he catches up to the plane, gets on, and he has a con has a confrontation not just with Red Skull but with other Hydra mem members, and he kind of lets go all the the bombs. Like one had like there was one bomb that had uh, these bombs that have like pilot seats, so they're going to be like flown to these cities and dropped. There's one bomb that had, like, the word Boston, Chicago, New York, like, so. So he then goes and has a conversation with the Red Skull, and, you know, the two of them fight, but then Steve is able to knock the contraption that he has the Tesseract inside. He's been using the Tesseract to fuel all of his, all of their guns and all their machinery and Steve knocks that contraption loose so now the Tesseract is loose and Red Skull he picks it up and he in Raiders of the Lost Ark style is blasted into the cosmos and then 
the tesseract is dropped and it burns its way through the burns its way through the bottom of the Valkyrie and falls into the ocean. Um, Howard Stark finds it later on when they are searching for Tony. The, the searching searching for uh, Captain America. My bad. Um, Howard Stark uh, picks up the tesseract and starts experimenting on it. And Steve, he ends up crash landing the Valkyrie in the Arctic Circle. He lays down his life to save millions. And then this is kind of a back to the future. You know, if you remember from the opening scene, they found him. So now, last scene of the movie, he wakes up in what looks like 1940s New York. And they're playing an old uh, baseball game on the radio. He says, I know that game because I was there. What's going on? Then a bunch of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents come in and he kind of pushes them away. He busts out of that room, runs outside, finds out that he's in the 21st century. And then he is approached by none other than Nick Fury. I think this event also happens during Nick Fury's big week. Nick Fury says, at ease, soldier. Sorry about that back there. We thought it was best to break the information to you slowly. And then Steve says, I had a date. You know, Steve Rogers, he is the man out of time. He is, I guess, has the fear of missing out on the life that he was supposed to live with Peggy Carter. And now he is in the 21st century. And instead of at first him being taller from that first run through Brooklyn, now he wakes up in Times Square. All the buildings are taller than him now. All of the structures have outgrown him. So. So, yeah, and the credits, credits roll. And then the, there's one post credit scene uh, in this movie. It's a end, end credit scene. Yeah, end, end credit scene. It's after the credits. And it's essentially just a commercial for... I mean, they've only... Marvel's only done this one other time uh, more recently. But this post credit scene is essentially a commercial for The Avengers, which is our next film... And yeah, the in which which I'll which I'll talk about in the closing. But yeah, the um, it's pretty much a promotion for uh, the Avengers. Was that was all the post credit scene was. So yeah, that's pretty much it for uh, Captain America: The First Avenger. So Captain America the First Avenger was the origin story of of Captain America. It was Steve Rogers' journey from a little, you know, scrawny kid who just wanted to who just wanted a chance, who just wanted to do all that he could to, to contribute to America's war effort. His journey from being that little scrawny kid who just wanted to do his part to becoming a war hero to having a serum that amplifies whatever was already inside of him. He was already a good man, you know, just trying to do his part. And even Erskine said, the night before his procedure, he said, no matter what happens tomorrow, stay who you are, a good man. What matters is what is on the inside. More than what's on the outside. His, you know, his character was, was very, very important. And his selflessness, his, his ability to lay down his life so that millions and millions of people could live. You know, one man making that sacrifice in the heat of the moment. And then also him being a man out of time and waking up in the 21st century no Peggy Carter, there's, you know, I mean, we won the war, you know, won the war, and, you know, Hydra was defeated, and, 